Uh, good evening and welcome. Uh, I'm Finlay Carson, MSP. I'm the convener of the Rural Affairs, Islands and Natural Environment Committee, and I would like to welcome you all to this special online edition of the Festival of Politics 2021 in partnership with the Parliament's think tank, Scotland's Future Forum. Uh, this evening's panel is titled, Should We Stop Eating Fish? And it's held in partnership with Aberdeen University, of which I'm proudly donning my Aberdeen University tie. And uh, we're, we're delighted that so many of you have been able to join us online this evening. And I look forward to hearing your comments and questions as uh, we get into the discussion. So the controversial Netflix documentary, Sea Spiracy, caused uproar in the fishing industry with its claims of overfishing, pollution and damage to our oceans. How accurate are these claims when it comes to Scotland's sea and fishing industry? Who is in charge of maintaining our healthy seabed and thriving ecosystem? And what role do marine protected areas offer for well-managed Scottish seas? This panel aims to address all of these questions in the next 60 minutes, so do please stay with us. Um, and we're delighted that you are all able to join us to take part, and I would encourage you to use the event chat function to introduce yourself, state your name and your geographical location, and pose any questions you would like the panel to respond to. And I'm very pleased to be joined by our three panellists, Elspeth MacDonald, uh, the Chief Executive of Scottish Fishermen's Federation, Tara Marshall, School of Biological Sciences at the University of Aberdeen, and Phil Taylor, the co-founder and head of policy from Open Seas, an organisation that shares a passion for sustainable fish. Um, so there will be an opportunity for our online audience to put questions and views to the panel throughout the event. And if you'd like to make a contribution, contribution please enter them into the question and answer box. Uh, and, and make sure that you state your name and where possible this afternoon. We'd like to get through as many as, as possible as many questions as we can. However, I'd like to begin by asking each of our panellists to give me a snapshot of how they would describe the state of Scotland's seas in relation to our fishing industry. Um, so I'll come first to Elspeth MacDonald, and then Tara Marshall, and then Phil Taylor. Thank you. Uh, Elspeth, can I ask you to outline your thoughts, please? Thank you, convener, and and can I also just thank the um, the organisers of tonight's event for the opportunity to speak at something like this. It's a it's a really good opportunity to, to talk about some of these these uh, important issues that that you've just mentioned in in your introduction. I think um, you know we need to look at Scotland's seas in terms of supporting a very diverse range of marine activities, of which uh, fishing absolutely is one and a, and a very important one. So there's a lot of diverse activities that take place in the marine environment, and indeed fishing itself is diverse. So if you look at what the, the Scottish fleet catches, we catch demersal fish. These are the ones that uh, swim quite close to the seabed, pelagic fish, the ones that shoal in midwater, and, and also a wide range of shellfish. And we've got a very diverse industry here. There's uh, over 2,000 fishing vessels in the Scottish fleet, ranging from the, the very smallest to the very largest, and, and many of those uh, are within the membership of my organisation, and there are um, just under around 5,000 uh, fishermen in Scotland. So it's a it's a diverse and wide-ranging industry, and I think it's really important that we recognise our fishing industry is is really importantly part of Scotland's food supply. You know, we're supplying healthy, high-protein seafood with an extremely low carbon footprint. And um, in 2019, it's been estimated that the, the, the carb carbon emissions from our fishing fleet were actually less than 1% of Scotland's total. And of course, any type of food production has an impact, whether it's fishing, whether it's rearing livestock or growing fruit and vegetables. So what we need to ensure as a responsible industry is that we continue to be actively involved in improving sustainability, because it's fishermen, after all, who probably have the greatest vested interest in ensuring that our fish stocks are sustainable for the future. And we can't look at fishing in isolation from other users of the sea. We share our sea space with so many others, especially, particularly sitting where I am in the northeast of Scotland here, with the energy sector, the oil and gas sector, and increasingly around our coast, and, and will be increasingly more so in future, marine renewables. And here in the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, we also engage actively and constructively in marine conservation initiatives. We've worked for many years now with government and the nature conservation bodies on the development of Scotland's network of marine protected areas, and we'll be speaking about them uh, as we go through the session tonight. 
And here in the industry, we are also uh, ensuring that we are increasing our knowledge and understanding of what happens in our seas. We invest in scientific research, data collection, and, and very importantly, looking at innovation in terms of how we can make our industry e efficient, sustainable, and successful. So, I think in summary, we need to recognise that Scotland produces some of the very best seafood in the world, products that are in high demand at home and abroad, and there's a growing population and a growing demand for food. And seafood has a hugely important contribution to make to securing our food supply. And certainly, we here in the industry, we want to continue to work in partnership with others to make sure that we can continue to do that sustainably now and also in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elspeth. And I'll now move on to Tara. Thank you very much, Finlay, and I'm very pleased to be here tonight to discuss Scottish seafood and the health of marine ecosystems generally. For my opening remarks, I knew that both Elspeth and Bill would give excellent snapshots, so what I thought I'd uh, take a slightly different variation on that and consider our direction of travel, you know, considering where we started, where are we now, and where are we going. Um, so I'll begin with two examples of what I would consider positive directions of travel. The first is for defining healthy fisheries. Delivering sustainability requires defining it in operational terms. And the collapse of the northern cod stock off the coast of Newfoundland in the early 90s illustrated that there was no real framework for being able to define and monitor sustainability. So throughout the late 90s and the early noughties, um, a framework was developed. And this framework currently shows us that um, Scottish seafood, um, not all stocks, because of course it's a natural resource, things swing up and down due to the whims of the environment, among other things. But um, overall, we've seen that the percentage removal of the harvestable biomass has decreased from 50% in the 90s to about 20%. That value of 20% annual removal rate is really within the sweet spot of marine maximum sustainable yield. We're removing less than is removed through natural mortality. And scientists generally consider this to be a reasonably sustainable um, place to be. We monitor it very carefully, and uh, year on year, we adjust it accordingly. So how can we sustain this direction of travel going forward? I think one of the most pressing challenges that we face is climate change. We need to adapt our framework to consider the impacts that climate change is going to have on productivity and yields. My second example relates to how do we measure and monitor um, uh, healthy ecosystems, marine ecosystems. And this, this goal um, has really benefited over the past decades from developing sort of metric-based system of performance management. When we were part of the European Union, of course, we were legislated by things like the Marine Strategy Framework Directive and the Habitat Directive. These laid out that um, uh, uh, sort of quantitative framework. Uh, this is the rule book for defining success and failure, and it was ways for de defining things like good environmental status. So I think they used a, a variety of descriptors, quantitative metrics, um, and these were updated annually by all manu uh, member countries. This approach will be uh, followed in future because now that we've left the EU, we're still signatories to OSPAR, um, and OSPAR um, is quite in alignment with the European uh, Union approach. And uh, you know, the term metric-based performance indicators might be a little bit unfamiliar, but I just want to um, uh, remind you that you might have encountered them already in terms of the National Performance Framework um, and also the UN Sustainable Development Goals. These are the same approach of trying to measure and monitor uh, success or failure in a, achieving um, objectives. Once again, I'll, I'll think about going forward. We need to adapt these for climate change, and specifically, I'm looking to the UK Fisheries Act, which has a specific objective related to climate change. It's quite poorly defined at the moment, and the scientific community and the Everybody else who's concerned should consider how we're going to define that operationally going forward. There are a few areas where I think um, we're ma not making progress at the rate um, that perhaps we should be. 
um, I'd like to highlight uh, fisheries co-management. Uh, co-management is the flexible and cooperative management of aquatic resources by user groups and the government. Um, and I think that uh, there's been a lot of uh, desire to achieve co-management, but there's um, perhaps not the, uh, the delivery of, of that um, uh, aspiration. So I look to the future fisheries management strategy that Marine Scotland produced. Um, I think they interpret co-management to mean communication, but it's more than that. Co-management is co-management. It's more than stakeholder engagement. So I think we really need to uh, um, develop that. And going forward, I think it would be useful to examine how co-management is being delivered in other countries. Um, I look to the west coast of the U.S., specifically the Alaskan fisheries, the Pacific Northwest. They're doing excellent um, co-management, really state-of-the-art, um, and in particular, uh, fully documented fisheries. Uh, to end on a little bit more downbeat note, um, are there areas of uh, perhaps sliding backwards over the past three decades that I've been involved in fisheries management. In Scotland, um, I've been here for about 20 years now. I would have to say that there's been a slow erosion of the scientific capability of Marine Scotland. I don't mean this as a critique of Marine Scotland or the scientists who work there, but this is a festival of politics, so I thought it worth uh, raising this point. It's, um, Marine Scotland has a distinguished uh, track record of scientific excellence, but they're currently, the demands on them are largely uh, regulatory in nature and policy related, and the scientific uh, capability is being compromised, and I think that's really to the detriment, and in particular, of delivering on aspirations with respect to climate change research. I'm a member of the academic community, but I really want a strong um, Marine Scotland, so I would really encourage um, perhaps a, a reconsideration of the basic funding level. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tara. And uh, final for the opening remarks, I will move to uh, Phil Taylor. Phil, please. Thanks, Finley, and thanks to the Festival of Politics team for this event and uh, the panelists as well for being you know, able to have this debate with you. Um, I'll be trying to be quick. I mean, um, unsurprisingly, I'm going to contrast with what uh, my co panelists have said. Um, the best snapshot we have is the snapshot that was published by the Scottish Government uh, in December 2020, actually, the last working day of 2020. Um, the Scottish Marine Assessment 2020, which I would uh, advise everybody uh, watching to go and have a look at. Um, sadly, that shows that we failed um, against a range of metrics uh, to secure the health of our marine ecosystem. Um, we had a target within something called the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. It's a bit of EU law. It's actually pretty much still competent in Scottish law despite Brexit, um, which uh, set 15 indicators for <coughs> good environmental status in our sea, and we failed 11 of those. Um, so there's some real significant issues here. Overfishing. Uh, you know, there's a real problem with monitoring uh, a significant number of our stocks. Um, but <clears throat> uh, the Scottish Marine Assessment uh, estimated 45% of our fisheries were overfished or unsustainably fished. Sorry, um, the Scottish Government's National Performance Framework estimates that at around two thirds. Um, of course, there's a massive problem, like I said, with with a, a significant proportion of fisheries still not being assessed. So actually, that, that is a very small sample size we're looking at, even even there. Um, we failed to uh, achieve targets to end uh, the loss of biogenic reefs, and we failed to end uh, uh, overfishing, uh, which was a sustainable development goal by 2020. Um, there's some real big problems in front of us. Um, you, you asked us, convener, uh, to, to ask, answer this in the context of fishing, um, and in, in that context, uh, I've answered it here, but I think it is also worth remembering that there are a lot of stresses on the sea, and, and fishing does sit within that context, and we need to get a handle on on that broader sense too. Um, but uh, as I said, we've got to be led by the evidence and that marine assessment did find that fishing was the most significant and most widespread pressure uh, throughout the majority of Scotland's marine regions. So it is, it is uh, a very high, it's either the top of the list or it's very high on it. Well, thank you very much uh, for that and, and thank uh, all three panelists for your opening remarks. It's certainly uh, food for thought. Um, I'm going to uh, ask a, a couple of questions to, to kick off. 
Um, now, it's it's quite clear when it comes to land ownership, who, who owns the land, and, and we have natural heritage, uh, and we've got SNH or, or, or Nature Scott or whatever now. But the sea is slightly different, isn't it? it it's, it's not quite easy to, to, to work out who is in charge of it. So, can I come to you, Tara, and, and ask you, for, for the people who are watching today who may not know, can you tell them exactly who is in charge of maintaining a healthy seabed and, and a thriving ecosystem? Yes, um, I've, I consider that we all um, own um, the common resource of the ocean, and we empower our government uh, to uh, enact the legislation that is developed um, to achieve some level of oversight over the status of those marine resources. So I think that it really means that we all need to get engaged in the, um, managing what is our resource. Now, the fishing industry uh, does not own those resources. They are stewards of the resources. They have a long-term interest in sustainability, and they uh, they make money off of that resource. So, uh, in essence, as we move into an era, uh, an era of having shared goals with respect to sustainability. I think there's the potential for all of us to be pulling in the same direction of recognizing the long-term value of our ocean resources, but I regard ultimately as uh, um, as society having a, a ownership over those resources. Thank you. And, and Elspeth, you represent uh, a fisherman, um, and obviously they, they've got to earn their, their, their livelihoods from fishing. So, from a fishing a fisherman's point of view, um, who do you think is in charge? And uh, is it just government? Is it is it uh, environmental activists? Uh, who 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 should take charge and maintain the healthy seabed? Well, I very much agree with with Tara. Uh, you know, there's no one person or body who could who could ever be responsible for something as broad as this. And, and as you said in your opening remarks. It, this isn't like the terrestrial environment where land is owned by by, by somebody or, or um, groups of people. So there's a very, as I said in my, my opening remarks, there's a really wide range of activities that take place in the sea, of which fishing is one. But there are there are many many others. Whether that's, as I said, the oil and gas industry, whether it's renewables, aquaculture industry, for example, marine tourism. It's it's really a pretty long list. So I think. Um, all of the sectors operating in our marine environment have responsibilities for making sustainable use of our resources, and that will involve obviously working with the regulatory bodies that have different responsibilities. And I'm, I'm sure tonight that in our discussions we'll, we'll touch on some of these things in a, in a bit more detail. But I very much agree with, with Tara. This is not any one person or any one sector's responsibility. It is all of our responsibilities. Okay, thanks. And finally, uh, Phil, you, you represent. Uh... Uh, a charity working to improve the health of the seas, and, and you're a you're, you're a marine, marine campaigner. What, what's your perspective on this? Well, in terms of whose responsibility it is for maintaining that healthy marine ecosystem, I think it's pretty unequivocal. It's legislatively, it's uh, the responsibility of CABSEC here in Scotland uh, for our inshore, and then through uh, sort of uh, de devolution settlement through uh, the Marine Scotland Act. Uh, more broadly, out to 200 nautical miles uh, as well, um, despite the fact that it's under a bit of UK legislation. Um, the, um, con you know, the, the <clears throat> concept of who, whose responsibility that is, then, and then how, how does that cascade from, you know, uh, the current uh, fisheries minister's responsibility down into decision making? I think uh, I'd subscribe to what Tara was saying about co-management. I think that those systems uh, are shown to work well but they have to be um uh, uh held within a framework that then uh, brings with the um responsibility accountability uh, and when we see that those two things get um separated uh, as you'll know just on land i mean we've seen this in, in many cases just on land um uh, the, the, the real problems start to occur because you effectively end up in a situation where no one's accountable now there's a constitutional issue here that i'm just going to touch on because i'm you know charity's constitutionally agnostic I uh, don't really want to get into too much detail on that, but uh, the Smith Commission recommended that uh, the the whole uh, the, the sea be devolved wholly to 
the Scottish uh, Scottish government and, and the Scottish Parliament. Um, and um, the UK Fisheries Bill was passed by Westminster, that then took some of that management, or basically replaced the Common Fisheries Policy, and then and brought some of those powers to Westminster that were, were currently sat in in Holyrood. Now, at the time. Um, uh, the SNP government in Westminster voted against that, but at the same time, the SNP party in Holyrood passed a legislative consent motion to bring that, that legislation into Scottish law. So there was a, there was a real contradiction there, and, 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 and there's a real uh, then lack of clarity. So like I said, it's not a constitutional point, agnostic in, the, in that term, but there's a, there's a lack of clarity then as to who, uh, uh, where, the, who, which parliament actually has supremacy on some of those issues. And, um, and how then the governments that are making decisions about these issues are then held, held accountable. And that's critical because at the moment we're um, going in, you know, the, the, under, uh, you, you, you talked about land ownership and, and, and what quota, you know, the equivalent here is quota ownership. And, and the, the quota system, you know, is required, uh, the, the ministers are required to distribute quota in a way that uh, delivers best social, economic and environmental criteria. That's something we can all subscribe to pretty good, right? But at the moment, they're not doing that. They're effectively doing it based on, 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 on the distribution of quota previously, the historic track record. And they're not actually bringing in then any criteria, which are thinking about, well, how can we use this quota to incentivize change? How can we use this quota to, to drive change? And, you know, Elspeth said that fishing is really important for the, for the food system, but, you know, macro quota, for example, macro and heron quota really heavily consolidated. You all have seen the, the headlines from Greenpeace saying, you know, five families control uh, about a third of, of the quota in Scotland. Um, but th that quota is, you know, 50% of that quota is getting landed directly abroad, completely bypassing our um, food systems, our economy, and, you know, us as consumers. It's a real problem, right? And it's not really delivering them the best economic, social, or environmental outcomes necessary for us. And um, like I said, the, the constitutional issue is not going into, but because there's this lack of clarity between the UK, UK Fisheries Act competence within Scotland, there's a problem with regards to how we actually resolve this issue and how we then start to think about returning the best value for the Scottish public who, who own this resource, as Tara and Elspeth have said, um, from these assets, which are getting distributed by by our current ministers. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Phil. Um, I'm I'm going to keep on that uh, sort of theme. Um, you know, we talk about quotas and and potential overfishing and so on, and who's responsible. I've had an audience question from David, um, who's an ex trollerman, who's asking if the the overfishing is due to EU or Scottish fishing boats. In Scottish water. So, Phil, can I ask you that first, and then move to Elspeth? Sure. Yeah. A uh, combination, of course. I mean, it depends on which stock. Sorry, I haven't seen the question. Um, but uh, it, through most of our waters, uh, fish stocks are shared, and therefore you will find that um, EU and Scottish fishing boats are targeting the same species. Now, what the, the problem we are in at the moment is, is the sort of uh, fallout from Brexit, and therefore there is a bit of a sort of uh, an aggression between the two parties when they're coming to the negotiation table on these issues to, to sort of um, drive those catches higher, race to overfish, a race to the bottom. It's a problem, it's a real problem. Of course, Scottish ministers have themselves made decisions that have led to overfishing. They could uh, easily see, you know, that they're gonna fish, we're going to fish less. That wouldn't necessarily be the best outcome economically for, for Scottish fishing businesses. But there's several cases where that decision has been, you know, really just a, a, a domestic. A domestic issue. We look at the West Scotland cod fishery. It's uh, the scientific advice is for no fish to be caught whatsoever. Probably pretty practically uh, impractical that because it's by caught at uh, significant volumes in the um, nephrops trawl fishery, the scampi fishery. Um, but um, what we're seeing at the moment is that about 1,200 tons of quota being made available for that stock. So that's 1,200 tons of overfishing. Um, and that quota is being siphoned into a fishery that's then targeting it elsewhere. So it was meant to be available for the bycatch, so, so as not to choke, a term that I don't really buy into, but to choke the fishery. Um, but instead what's happening is that, that choke issue, the bycatch issue is ongoing, those fish are still being killed uh, and they're still being lost from the population. Meanwhile, that 12,000 tonnes is being taken by a, a separate part of the fishing industry, which then going and targeting it in the deeper waters. 
So we've got a, what I would call a hyper overfishing problem in that instance. Um, and that is a decision that's being made domestically and uh, regarding domestic boats. Um, there is a small degree of that that's, uh, that's relevant to the EU boats as well. Uh, like I said, it depends on the stock, I'm afraid. Okay, Elspeth, I'm going to move to that before I do, but can I ask the audience if, if they want to start submitting questions, please do, do so now and we'll pick them up as we, we go through the, the, the conversation. So, Elspeth, can you pick up on, a, on, on the back of Phil and where's the overfishing coming from? Well, I think it's very important that we look at this in context. I think uh, absolutely some of our stocks have been overfished in the past. Um, I think the situation in Scotland is, is very much improving. Um, we've already spoken, I think, earlier in the evening about the fact that we have limited data on some of our stocks. But I think it's important that we look at the, we look at the trend, we look at the direction of travel. And I think Tara mentioned this earlier on. I think it is um, important that we recognise that the direction of travel on our on our fisheries and fishing sustainably is improving rather than rather than decreasing. I think also we're. I think it's likely that we'll touch a bit later on about this issue of, of bycatch. It's a very complicated issue. Um, I think Phil has described a, a specific problem. I think we have to understand that we don't have species here that, uh, when we're looking at these um, demersal and, and shellfish species that are in isolation from each other, it is very difficult to catch some species without catching others. And, and it's important that fisheries managers are able to make sensible management decisions that, that, that can allow fisheries be able to continue. Um, I think the questioner asked about um, whether overfishing might be due to uh, a UK fleet or due to EU fleet. I would I would actually highlight a particular issue that we have at the moment with the with the, the mackerel fishery in the Northeast Atlantic. That's managed through a, a process known as coastal states. Um, the UK uh, has been um, uh, frankly, uh, appalled by the unilateral tax setting by some of our coastal state neighbours who have been fishing the stock uh, above levels that uh, that align with the with the IC's advice. So I think we have to look at the, the context of of these fisheries. We have to look very much at understanding the the complex dynamics of our fisheries. As I say, we aren't unfortunately we are not yet able in many of our fisheries to go and only catch the species of interest. We have mixed fisheries. A bit different in the pelagics, big big shoaling species, perhaps easier to catch them with, with less bycatch. But I think we have to look at the overall trends. They are, they are they are improving, and we have better fisheries management. I absolutely agree with Tara's point about we need to invest more in our science. That we have a lot of data gaps. We have a lot of um, a lot of stocks where, the, where we are data deficient. And I think it's really important that we can improve our understanding and absolutely improve um, knowledge of how our what 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 impact we and and other processes uh, are having on our, our on our marine environment? Thank you, Elspeth. We'll probably touch on uh, bycatch a little later, but on, on the back of what already has been said, Tara, um, there's a question from Elaine. Uh, do you feel that fishermen are adequately involved in the management of frameworks uh, and and the research across uh, the fleet uh, and and the scale and the size of the fleets? And are there barriers that, that you are aware of that uh, we can work to, to improve in this area to ensure that uh, stakeholders are, are very much involved? Yeah, thank you, Elaine, for that that question. I um, I think it's a very good one. Um, we've made um, some positive steps in that in the direction of engagement, and that is. Um, an example of that would be the regional advisory committees or the advisory committees under the old EU system that brought stakeholder groups together. Certainly, different stakeholder groups are able to attend the assessment working groups um, that are held at ICs annually, and there's certainly um, a stakeholder representatives at uh, the old December Council meetings, and I presume at the trilateral meetings going forward and things like that. So the system over time has opened up a lot. It's created complications because that just means there's a lot more people in the room. Um, there's a lot more diversity of opinions that need to be expressed. I think what we could work on is develop a mechanisms for um, making these discussions efficient and developing consensus 
um, uh, to promote definable actions going forward. But when I think of co-management, I think of it as more than just bringing people around the table. I uh, regard it as uh, being involved on the day-to-day -day collection, um, analysis, interpretation, and presentation of information. And I think that there's a lot of scope for improvement uh, to empower different groups because, of course, scientists are very data-driven. Don't uh, We don't take anecdote, for example. We want to see the data and we want to see it on large timescales, large spatial scales, and uh, we need the stakeholder groups to start engaging with that you know, heavy lifting of developing the evidence base. And there's a few positive initiatives. I'll point out the pelagic self-sampling uh, system that got up and running, spearheaded by the Scottish Pelagic Fishermen's Association. And that's running, um, generating data from the industry to feed into the IC's assessment of herring and mackerel. Thank you very much. Nick, just we're going to move back to, to bycatch because it's a term that we, we hear quite a lot. Um, so, uh, Phil, can I ask you what is meant by bycatch uh, and why the uniquely Scottish form of langoustine fishing causes bycatch and, and what its impact is? We may have lost Phil, actually. Oh, no. I'm back. Sorry. Thank you. Did you, did you hear the question? A bit of it, sorry. So, okay, um, we, we're talking about bycatch. Uh, why is the unique, uniquely a Scottish form of langoustine fishing um, cause bycatch uh, and, and its impact? So, specifically about the langoustine fishing bycatch. Yeah. Give us uh, some information on that, please. For sure, yeah. It's uh, certainly not a Scottish uh, only problem. Um, you know, we've seen massive bycatch volumes in some of the uh, Skagorak um, Katagat uh, fishery uh, as well. Um, the uh, problem is because, uh, you know, nephrops, the species you're trying to catch, are relatively small, so you need a relatively small mesh size. Now, there are uh, means to um, uh, filter out some of the catch as it's going through the net, you know, um, Swedish panel, uh, square mesh. Uh, these are different types of uh, Technology you can fit it onto the um, the the net as you turn it through the water, um, but the the key issue is as Elspeth said, um, you know this is a mixed fishery. You end up catching other stuff with it. In the North Sea, uh, a lot of um, what you're catching there is uh, saleable size, and uh, or a proportion of it is saleable size, and uh, therefore can be taken from the quota for those other stocks. Um, sadly, in some other parts of uh, Scotland, what, what we're seeing is that the, the, the bycatch is largely um, very small. And um, so, you know, we did some work a couple of years ago where you basically, we basically compared um, the landings of, of that, that nephrops species with the landings of these other species that you would expect to be bycaught. And you see for, you know, 150 tonnes of nephrops landed, you see maybe 10 kilograms odd. Uh, and that is just a completely unrealistic catch proportion. You you wouldn't expect that to be the case. Therefore, um, you know that 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 fish has sadly gone over the over the side uh, dead at some point. Um, you know, bycatch discarding is a is a serious problem. Uh, it's illegal um, in most cases. There's exemptions in various ways. I won't go into. Um, and everyone accepts it's happening. Um, you know, uh, so it's a real problem. It's one of these sort of uh, cultural changes, cultural problems that we've got in the fishing industry, and the, the real problem is that that which I mentioned uh, at the top there, which is that if if we're not if we're not counting the amount of fish that are being bycaught in this way and then and then discarded, um, we don't actually know how many fish are being killed in these fisheries. We're failing at like the first hurdle. The first hurdle of fisheries management is establish how many fish there are, establish how many fish are being killed from that stock, and then come up with a mechanism for of managing that in line with sustainable limits. And um, yeah, we're failing at that first hurdle. Um, sorry if that's not exactly what you're asking. Yeah, well, we've had a question from Alistair online um, suggesting that uh, you're anti-mobile fishing um, and asking what you propose to do with info inshore trawlermen uh, when a lot of what you propose is, is to stop it. 
and remembering that jobs at sea, for every job there is at sea, there's four jobs on land. So, Phil, how can you work with industry to ensure that we don't turn the lights off in our, our rural fishing communities? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> a couple of things to unpack there. Um, firstly, I'm, I'm not uh, anti-fishing and uh, anti-mobile fishing, and uh, I don't, you know, open seas isn't either. Um, you know, what we're what we're pro is establishing a, a sustainable management system for it. Um, it's clear from in, in uh, all the evidence, including evidence and research collected by uh, people commissioned by the industry, that spatial management is needed in Scotland's inshore to get to that stage where those fisheries are no longer having a significant negative impact on the habitat and then via bycatch on these other issues as well. Um, the um, point about turning off the lights, uh, so first it's important to note that Scottish government's uh, research has shown that if you were to um, uh, establish a three mile limit, this highly contentious topic, uh, establish a three mile limit, you would increase the GVA return from the nephrops fishy, fishery annually. And if you were to come up with a slightly different spatial management regime, one that um, uh, takes account of trawling uh, within that three mile as well, you would increase it yet further. So um, the evidence is actually the opposite way around. Um, and th there's, this atmosphere, there's this attitude that, you know, the, the trawlermen are the sort of backbone of the, the coastal communities and without them the lights are going off. It's just sadly not true. I mean, it, they're important in various places. Uh, it's, you know, let's, Move, moving away from the Clyde and, and the West Coast, um, look at the Brock, Fra Fraserburgh. You know, the, Fraserburgh is one of the biggest trawl ports in Scotland and has uh, a part, parts of Scotland, uh, Fraserburgh, are in the lowest um, Scottish in, index on multiple deprivation scores. Um, there's a mismatch between, between what is happening at sea and what is happening in these communities already. And this is part of the point I was making with regards to quota. We need to re-establish that link. We need to use things like the quota system to incentivize those changes. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, again, I haven't seen the question, but if the if the assertion is like, you know, th these are sustainable fisheries and they're they're doing a good job already meeting the sustainable uh, objectives, then that what I'm suggesting is we should incentivize that. That's great. Let's give those fisheries more access to more quota more opportunity and let's use that just in the same way as we use the subsidy system in, in, in farming to, to, to uh, create a race to the top rather than a race to the bottom. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Tara, uh, there was a mention uh, in Phil's response about the data uh, or, or, or the lack of data around uh, fish that was lost. Can, can you, as, as an academic, give us any, shed any light on what data there yep. is about yep. Yeah, thank you. Wasted you overfishing or bycatch. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Finlay, for giving me that opportunity to respond because um, I think it does need a response. Now, Phil is very different from myself. He works, uh, you know, his interests are, are are more in the inshore. I know relatively little about the inshore, but uh, uh, and I work with the offshore industries. And the, the, I don't want the audience to have the impression that we don't know how much is discarded. For the largest commercial fisheries in Scotland, as well as Europe, we have quantitatively estimated the amount of fish being discarded, and this information is entered into the annual assessments. There is distinction between catch and landings, and so we have tracked the amount of discarding over time, and we see that it's gradually coming down. That is the picture in those areas. No one in the fishing industry wants to discard, so I think we have to be clear about that. Now, with respect to the inshore uh, fisheries, I accept they're more data limited. They're small boats, and there's many of them. So it's more difficult to get a quantitative overview of what's going on. But that's not to say that there aren't initiatives. The Scottish Government is very focused on this task um, at the current time. I'll mention CIFIDS, um, which is the Scottish Inshore Fisheries something or other, uh, run out of St. Andrews, and they're equipping small boats um, uh, in the scallop industry to 
uh, take a variety of measurements, and it's quite sophisticated, quite state of the art. And literally, I look to it to see where the offshore should be going because they're doing fantastic things. Uh, these are initiatives. They're getting off the ground, but there's a long-term commitment to making them work. I have a PhD student working on electronic monitoring in the skull of industry. So I think it would be misleading to say that uh, that this, there's simply no information. We need more information, agreed. Um, but we have to get these uh, systems for measuring information on these small boats um, uh, in the inshore. Thank you, Tara. And, and, and Elspeth, you know, I come from a farming background, and I know farmers are having to, to change to, to address climate change as well. Um, and, and there's one thing about the theory, but it's a different thing in practice. But collectively, I, I would suggest that the, the, the farming community uh, are, are up for the fight, if you like. So, given that, that there's some, uh, as Tara has mentioned, initiatives and schemes. How are our Scottish fishermen adopting these new methods uh, to do their part to, to ensure that the Scottish fishery is sustainable? I think in, in, in the context of climate change, which I think is, is the question you're asking, Finlay, I think it's really important to understand both that there's, there's certainly there's things that the fishing industry will need to do to play our part in reducing our carbon emissions. We will need to play our part on that journey to net zero. Uh, but there's also uh, probably also a parallel with fishing in terms of the changes that we are seeing in our natural environment. And I think Tara alluded to this in her opening remarks about how the industry is going to have to adapt to things that are coming in future. And we are already seeing a, a change in the distribution of many of our fish stocks. And, and I think North Sea cod is a, is a, is a really good example of this. Um, we have now had two years. Um, I think almost now approaching three years of having um, scientific advice from ICES suggesting that the total allowable catch of North Sea cod must be very significantly reduced. Um, this is proving to be hugely problematic for the industry in Scotland. Cod is a, an, an absolutely iconic part of our mixed fisheries, and for all of the reasons we've spoken about before, it's it's very hard uh, to avoid catching cod. The problem we have is that there's quite strong evidence that 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 cod and other species are migrating northwards. I think there's been some estimates that cod are possibly moving north as much as about 12 kilometers a year. So what we are seeing now is a situation whereby the fishery science is not actually keeping up with the changes that we're seeing in the environment. So we have a mathematical model that, that does some clever number crunching and tells us how much cod we should be able to um, catch in a year. But that model is based on the whole of the North Sea. Yet we know that probably due to climate-related uh, reasons and, and warming temperatures, that cod are actually moving out of the southern North Sea, being replaced by other species. There are other things coming in to take their place. Um, so we are having to adapt in the industry in terms of um, what is going to be the impact of climate change on the distribution of what are completely wild, unmanaged fisheries. In terms of when I mean managed, I mean it's not like farming managed. Um, so there's that side of the coin. The other side of the coin is what will the industry do to make sure that we continue to contribute to that um, transition to net zero, reducing our, our, our environmental impact, our carbon emissions. And I think it, it, this, again, probably a parallel with farming. The more efficient that our operations can be in terms of the amount of the, the more efficient your boat's engines can be, the amount of fuel that you can reduce from your, from your operations, then that's not only contributes to reducing your economic cost of your operations, but it also contributes to reducing your your emissions of your operations. So there's a lot that can be done in terms of the existing um, existing way in which the fleet operates, if you like, modern engines, modern propulsion systems, hull design, all these sorts of things. But also looking forward, you know, how do we see electrification perhaps of the fleet? You know, perhaps some of the smaller inshore vessels, there might be some potential there not too far down the road to look at how you can sort of decarbonize the fleet. Hydrogen strategy has been announced by the UK government. Marine is part of that. Um, we would like to think that, that fishing vessels will be part of that strategy going forward. So there's, there's a great deal that we need to do in terms of our operations to um, adjust and adapt to climate change and do our bit to reduce the impact of climate change. There's a lot also that we have to do to adapt to the impacts of climate change. But I would just finish my response by reiterating my point about what a low carbon 
emission emitting food wild caught fisheries are you know they they re, they really compare very favorably to all other sources of protein thank you just and, and sticking with that we've had a, a question from amanda um uh, one of the the main points in the seaspiracy uh, program was that uh, fishing disturbs the marine environment in a way that significantly uh, contributes to climate change um tara can you comment on exactly uh, what that means and, and explain a little bit more. Um, actually, I haven't seen Seaspiracy. <laughs> I don't have Netflix. I don't spend a lot of time watching television. Um, so I can't exactly say, but Amanda said that uh, fishing contributes to, uh, um, I, I think I think that's not correct actually, because if you actually look at the carbon emissions caused by the global fishing industry, it, it would be on, or if you think about all of the carbon emissions on the planet, I think it's on on order of less than 4%, you know, much less than, you know, so it is, um, it is a very small um, proportion of carbon emitting activities. And I also think you have to balance that very carefully against the role it plays in, uh, human uh, food uh, protein, especially in continents like Africa, where they re derive about 25% of their um, protein from fish. Um, they don't have options. And so it's an economical resource for them. Um, and so it, it's very hard to make global statements about, uh, about situations that are very different locally um, in that respect, I'll also point out the nutritional value, as Elspeth will be obviously very aware of, of fish. So I don't recognize that uh, fishing itself, um, uh, there is a controversy at the moment about blue carbon and the release from the seabed, but the scientific evidence base for that is very partial and preliminary and subject to, uh, to discussion. I'll point out that Scotland has a working group headed by Bill Austin at uh, St. Andrews University looking into this for Scottish waters that's ongoing at the moment. So there should be more information about impacts on uh, carbon uh, from the seabed that, uh, at the moment. So I would be cautious about making any conclusion with a very, very uh, um, minimal data. And so, so, Phil, we've heard how the, the fishing fleet um, is, is trying to tackle uh, climate change with emissions in the future. Which can, can I have Open Seas a view on how fishing disturbs the marine environment uh, in a way that it contributes to climate change? What, what's your views on, on that comment? Uh, so, I'd agree with the point that Tara made that the evidence is still very much in its infancy. I think that um, there's some clear things i think that we can all sort of agree on um one of them is that uh you know the sea at the moment um, absorbs about i think it's 27 percent of the uh carbon we emitted last year was absorbed by the sea so the sea is this really important um part of the carbon cycle um that is largely done by plankton in the water column and uh, uh no fishing is really going to be having a serious impact on that cycle um the the sea floor itself, in particular, things like our sea locks are massive carbon stores, just in the same way that our peat bogs are. Uh, there's no doubt that trawling has an impact and resuspends that um, that carbon. There's an argument about what happens to that carbon once it's in the water column, and an arg argument about how much suspension uh, is caused. But it's it's obvious that the direction is in the in the direction toward emission. Um, clearly, as well, that there's there's what we call blue carbon habitats, or some people call blue carbon habitats, which are mostly uh, already um, part of uh, our sort of marine management system in the form of priority marine features or biogenic reefs. And, and as I said in my, in, in my opening statement, really, you know, those biogenic reefs, we failed our target. There was a target to, to pr prevent loss of biogenic reef by 2020. And uh, in 2010, when the Scottish government did their assessment, they found that, you know, we really needed to jump up, start, start a lot of work on this area. And sadly, we failed that in the, in the subsequent 10 years. So, you know, um, um, mill beds, for example, you know, hold, I think it's uh, 0.03 megatons of carbon a year. Um, 
from in Scotland, uh, and we 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 lost ten hectares of per hectare, sorry, and we lost ten hectares of of uh, mulberry in in that intervening period. So there's clearly a, a direction of travel on that. Um, the, the scale of that's un, unclear. I think that um, I would uh, completely uh, support the statement that both analysts have made that seafood are really low carbon protein. We should be eating more of them. You know, the, the question of uh, this talk is, should we stop eating fish? No, not at all. We should be eating more, um, but uh, we shouldn't be eating all of it. And um, we should be using our consumer powers to actually, um, you know, avoid the stuff that's causing all the harm uh, and also drive change within supply chains. Um, and, uh, you know, in that regard, it is worth noting that though uh, on an average, uh, and in particular, the, the, the species like mackerel and herring are really low carbon proteins, especially when you get them long lined uh, and you can get them really fresh if you're up in the northeast, um, long lined. Um, the uh, the opposite side of the spectrum, you know, you, you, you're going <laughs> to, you know, think that I'm, I've got some vendetta, but scallops and, and, and nephrops as shown by a paper that came out of uh, Sweden, I think it was, uh, are, the, are the opposite side of that and actually causing significant emissions because of the uh, fuel use uh, in, in, in dragging that gear and also the refrigeration in the product uh, as it goes through the supply chain. Um, so we do have to not just think about seafood as one thing, um, we have to think about it across the spectrum and recognise that some of those fisheries actually do have significant carbon footprints too. Thanks, Phil. You, you, you touched on marl beds. Um, that, these are one of the areas that's often protected and, and marine protected areas. Um, Elspeth, can I ask you, uh, what role do you think marine protected areas serve um, in, a, in, in the, the overall picture of a, a well-managed Scottish sea? Yes, um, as I said uh, at the outset, our, our industry, our organisation has spent a lot of time, invested a lot of um, effort and resources along the way working with uh, regulators on the network of, of Scottish um, marine protected areas. And I think what's really important to, to remember at, at, up front is that MPAs, these marine protected areas, they're, they're not created um, to manage Scottish seas. They're, they're certainly not a tool intended for fisheries management. Um, what they are there for is they're there to protect certain features, whether these are biodiversity features or geodiversity features. They've been put in place to protect particular features, some of the things that, that, that Phil mentioned, for example. So there certainly will be management measures in some MPAs that, that might limit fishing, um, maybe through seasonal or, or spatial measures, and that will be because that is considered necessary to meet the conservation objectives of, of whatever the feature is, has been designated for and what it's there to protect. Um, but I think it's important that we understand that they are not there per se for the purposes of fisheries management. They are there to conserve the, the feature that, 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 that is a, the site has been designated for, and 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 there's a lot of work between stakeholders like ourselves and uh, and others and and government to actually work through developing the right management measures to make sure that you can get that right balance of meeting the conservation objectives, but also meeting the uh, the sustainable harvesting uh, objectives, for example, from fishing. So. That's where we are with the um, with the MPAs. I think what we are obviously where we're now going in Scotland is we have a, a clear um, commitment in the policy cooperation agreement between the, the Scottish Government and the Scottish Greens to designate, I think it's at, at least 10 percent of Scotland sees as highly protected marine areas. And, and what we are expecting in those areas is that these will be areas where, where fishing and indeed other types of activities such as aquaculture, um, I think many, many forms of um, other other types of marine activity will, will will be prohibited in these areas. But MPAs are really important in terms of marine conservation and conservation of features, conservations of for biodiversity and geodiversity purposes. But we must remember that they are not there as a management tool for fisheries management. Although fisheries management measures may indeed be part of them. Thanks, Elspeth. We're, we're, we're running. We're starting to run out of time, so I'm going to come back to to Tara and then Phil. Can you also factor in um, a, a question we've had from from David uh, on wind, uh, offshore wind farms uh, and uh, also the oil drilling, how it affects the bed, but also how it affects uh, fishing. So, in, in the same light, and still looking at marine protected areas, Tara, what's your thoughts about how they can they can help us? They manage Scottish seas better. Um, 
can you cover those topics in in in, in a whole? Um, uh, I'm, but I'm going to introduce something slightly a variation on marine protected areas, which we think of as uh, static uh, parks, as uh, sort of that are are uh, are closed or or limited. And, and that's the concept of dynamic ocean management, where we use real-time information to develop things like real-time area closures if we're trying to protect mobile species. Uh, marine protected areas tend to be good for species that are not mobile. For example, shellfish species. They work well in tropical regions where the fish do not leave their reefs. They're very um, immobile. But our fish species here are highly mobile, and so they can swim in and out at, at their uh, leisure of um, uh, boundary areas. So um, I think that a, a more um, dynamic approach is to consider real-time information. It has been used before in Scottish waters during the COD recovery program. Um, they designed um, what were the world's first sort of um, real-time area closures. Um, that was uh, maybe a, a decade or so ago. And we're revisiting the concept on the west coast of Scotland with the uh, demersal industry there, who are now sharing information uh, to avoid uh, COD um, so in real time. So I think that those dynamic measures have a role to play for mobile species as well. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. Technology really does have a a, a role to play. Phil, can I can I ask you for your your, your thoughts on uh, marine protected areas and, and and what the other panelists have already said? Sure. Yeah, I think the marine protected areas largely yet to fill their potential here in Scotland. Um, you know, uh, most of the marine protected areas need some form of fisheries management, um, despite what else has has been said there. Uh, to meet their objectives, but also uh, you have to remember that the Scottish Government has a duty um, to use those sites to protect the and, and enhance the health of the marine area. So it's not just about the specific mole bed was here. They have that's the, that's the only tool that they're using to actually fill that uh, legal obligation that they have. So they need to do more. Um, and uh, the majority of them are still without any management. In fact, um, we actually saw one marine protected area lose its uh, management, so it had a trawl ban in place called the Windsock, and unlawfully the government um, allowed that to lapse. Um, the, um, the, 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 the point that uh, Tara made about these dynamic areas, actual spatial management, thinking outside of marine protected areas, I think is really important. You know, with, if we think about our land, we don't just have national parks and then, you know, you leave the rest of the countryside to be used um, in the most uh, uh, exploitative ways possible. You know, we need we need uh, um, uh, area uh, spatial area management as part of that broader system. And um, you know, the the sad the sad fact is that we still have illegal fishing um, in these closed areas as well. Um, just this week, uh, we had an incident uh, on the west coast of Scotland, and um, you know, this is an ongoing problem, which uh, every time we, we we find evidence of and report on, everyone tells us it's a uh, a limited problem that's going away, and it's really not. Okay, Phil, thank, thank you very much for that. Um, I've got one closing question, uh, just a very quick one. Uh, it's from Christina and Greg, uh, and the, the question is, uh, can we start trusting dolphin-safe labels on tins again? So this is maybe one, uh, I'll, I'll start with you, Elspeth. Um, I, I, well, we don't fish any tuna in, in our Scottish fisheries. Uh, we don't have tuna whilst we have uh, climate change and we have cod going north and there may indeed be incursions of tuna into Scottish waters. It's not a, uh, it, it's certainly not an, an issue for the guys within our membership. So I'm afraid I'm going to, I think probably Tara is better, better <laughs> probably better place to comment on that one than I am. Tara. Uh, I, like Elspeth, I have no real insight to add to the mix, but we're just about to submit a paper to a scientific journal um, highlighting the need to incorporate climate change as a, a sustainability metric that the eco-label should be using going forward. How uh, well are the individual fisheries prepared for impacts of climate change? Okay, thanks. And, and Phil? Um, 
as the guys have said, it's largely a Pacific problem where you, you know, the fisheries there are targeting. What they do is they look for where the dolphins are, they target that area, catch the dolphins, and then let the dolphins out the net, which is dolphin friendly, uh, which is a, which is obviously a problem. I think that there's a sort of overarching issue here, which is about the fact that we don't, there isn't good information about what's getting caught within all of our fisheries, and that comes back to that bycatch issue. Uh, and, and, and Tara talk, spoke at the beginning about some of the great examples on the, uh, in, in, in Alaska and elsewhere, where you have what we call fully documented fisheries. Fisheries management is full of these terms that pre people create, but fully documentary, documented fisheries just means everything that was caught is listed and captured. And I, I, I acknowledge what Tara was saying about the North Sea, um, some of the more offshore fisheries being better documented. But we still have massive data gaps as to um, what's what's happening in some fisheries, and that is uh, that is uh, ultimately inhibiting our ability to manage them properly. And um, we as consumers should be challenging that. Um, we at the moment are running the campaign uh, challenging those who call stuff responsible. Um, you know, the scam. One of the biggest scampy companies uh, CEOs downplayed discarding as uh, not immoral, um, despite the fact it's illegal. Um, and uh, and is packaging the product as, as as responsibly sourced. You know, we have to challenge that as consumers. We have to challenge that. We have to see this stuff and see it for what it is and ask uh, questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And and uh, and thank you all very much for for your your, your contributions uh, to this event and 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 the audience for their for their questions. Um. So before uh, we close, I'd like to give each of the panelists one minute. Uh, to sum up the issues raised in the discussion, uh, and if I can start to, uh, with Tara and then move to Phil and finally Elspeth. Okay, well, thank you very much for Finley uh, and uh, also to the audience, um, uh, particularly those who ask questions. Um, I just want to sum up by saying we've come a long way um, uh, since the collapse of Northern Cod in the early 90s. I was a PhD student in fisheries at the time, and it was a very scarring episode, but we've learned from it. Um, have we reached our final destination? No, we haven't, and we, we never will, but we keep moving on, and I think all of us coming together tonight uh, to discuss the sustainability of fish and our marine resources is a great example of how by working collectively uh, to develop consensus, to develop a set of priorities and move forward is, is definitely the way to go. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Um, well, I'll just respond to the, the question. Should we stop eating uh, fish? No, we should eat more of it, like I said. Um, we, but we should be selective and we should hold, We should either stop uh, eating some products or, or at least hold them for the time being to, to force change from supply chains. Um, those are products, you know, uh, uh, scallop dredge, dredge scallops from uh, Scottish fisheries, poorly managed at the moment, needs to be improved. And uh, we need to we need to put pressure on uh, the supply chain to actually start to make some of those proactive changes. And um, uh, I guess that's all I'm going to say for now. Thank you, Phil. And and finally, Elspeth. Thank you. Uh, it's been a it's been a really interesting discussion. Uh, so many questions that we haven't been able to get to today, but I think that just shows the 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 range and diversity of of, of interest in this topic. I think what's been clear tonight is that. Um, there's actually been a lot that we've, we three panellists have been able to agree on, but there have also probably been some things where we'll, we'll continue to disagree. Um, I think what, some themes that have come through really strongly here for me tonight are just how important science and investment in science uh, is at the moment and will continue to be going forward. And I think I, I absolutely echo Tara's comments at the start in terms of, you know, we mustn't lose any more capability here. We actually should be building our capability, our capacity. There's, there's, there's certainly work that date that industry does, but we need much more investment in, in our, in our fisheries science. Um, Co-management, another, the another theme that I think has come through strongly tonight from all of us in terms of um, how we, how we work collectively together to, to manage our fisheries well. And I think the, the future of fisheries management strategy that the Scottish government uh, published at the end of last year, I think touches on a lot of the things that we've spoken about tonight. Um, discards, how we reduce our bycatch, how we go forward in terms of managing our inshore fisheries. I think there's a great deal in there. And I think if the government um, gets the right approach to that future of fisheries management strategy, and we get that um, evidence-based approach, 
and and genuine co-management, then I think there's there's a great deal that, that we can secure through that. So lots to do. Thank you very much. Uh, and and thank you. And I think co-management certainly uh, seems to be a a, a a word that's been been used uh, repeatedly. And and obviously we welcome uh, everybody working together. But uh, there we must must end. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us uh, tonight and and making such a big contribution to our, our panel. Uh, which has been brought to you uh, in partnership with Aberdeen University. And I would very much like to thank our panel, Tara Marshall, Elspeth MacDonald, and Phil Taylor for giving up their time to take part. Um, and I may I take this opportunity to remind you that over the weekend, we have a number of discussions ranging from a just transition to diversity in Scottish politics, climate activism, and resilient cities, to name just a few. So I hope you can join in these discussions as well. So thank you very much for joining us and uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you.